Okay, I get as a moderator, I get the first question. So I'm going to ask basically the same question of both of you. I, I love your ideas, but it takes money to implement these ideas. I, I have a, a feel for what you're going to say, but I'm not certain. So I just want to ask you, where does the money come from? You might say, you know, here's the money I need to get started. So, for example, I'm guessing, Mark, uh, there has to be some funding here. Well, I'll just leave it at that. I hope you understand the question. If, if I love your idea and I say to you, I want to do this, but I need money, where does that money come from? Mark and then Sam. Sure. Um, well, thankfully, um, there's the Startup Society's Foundation. Uh, I, I can speak personally that... Um, we will have a wave of micro vouchers uh, spreading outward, about $15,000, uh, which I personally will be, be committing um, for this. We'd like to have a competition to see which uh, localities in a given region would go farthest in, um, in demonstrating an understanding of the op scale of the opportunities. Uh, in Somaliland, uh, a few years ago, we offered $30 work study um, micro scholarships um, and got rewarded with YouTube clips um, at the Somaliland uh, Institute of, of Sciences, I believe, um, by students there. In Sri Lanka, $30 um, uh, micro scholarships led to um, a 10 page report by kids in a rural village um, on how peer learning innovations could help spread skills. Um, based on the Lancaster system before public schools existed in the West. Uh, so the, we, we would like, with these $30 uh, micro-scholarship offers, uh, to incentivize hopefully many dozen communities to show their understanding of, of the next wave of opportunities in virtual free markets and in actual free zones. I hope very much, Tom, that will include um, going to the, your chapters on, the, uh, or your mentions of uh, ULEX and polycentric law. Mm -hmm. And it will be a delight to see maybe if the proceedings of, of the symposium uh, could be turned into work study projects um, where people transcribe, translate, and illustrate uh, as a first start. The rewards can scale up, and I think uh, to be interesting and excite the, the greatest response, if we had perhaps $100,000, $200,000 for the, the next layer beyond these initial introductory um, digital donations, challenge offers, to say, um, if you do show understanding of the SEZ opportunities, then maybe uh, we could go further in terms of um, matching whatever a crowdfunding campaign could be done. There are opportunities also which involve no um, financial cost for in-kind contributions, uh, students at Cal State Fullerton, when the Songdo uh, Free Zone was just getting planned, were engaged in how this could become in 2005. They, the New York Times wrote this up. They did work study projects to help that what is now a $30 billion private free zone initiative in Korea. They, they um, did research into how IT could be woven into the, the fabric of daily life there. Um, so that, we hope, will be a precedent if um, students here, uh, students in other uh, kindred uh, colleges worldwide, wish to engage and help the localities launch crowdfundable um, quick start free zones. Um, that, that would be an immensely valuable way for uh, these communities to, to benefit. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mark. Sam, where's the money come from? I think that there's interest on this offers enough. I, I think industry is, would be interested that to the extent that this opens up markets that are closed to industry, there's the, the gains are, could be enormous. So Russia has some new localization requirements. They don't have the server capacity to satisfy those requirements. So if you've got people sitting in the United States saying, we could be, we could be addressing this. There's a shortage here. There's demand for servers, and we could be providing some of this stuff. But they're locked out because of a localization requirement. That could be the perfect situation where someone says, well, if we had the digital trade zone, maybe we could actually go access those markets. If I can just follow up with that, I'll, I'll, really, I'll take question for it in a second. But 
you cited the foreign trade zone as an example. Um, I think that's a very apt example. And I guess there, there are private parties who go through the expense of trouble applying for an FTZ. Although, interestingly there, you know, a lot of these, apart from the alternative site designations, the single factory sites that uh, a lot of Moberg described earlier, if you're talking about the main site, it's usually like you know, a port of entry and it's owned by a local government, a county or <clears throat> municipal authority. I'm guessing that doesn't have to be part of a digital free trade zone, does it? it yeah, that's interesting. So you could there more easily start with, you, somebody says, I own a server farm. I want to apply yeah. for this status and they would not have to get the county or state on board. Yeah, no, absolutely. Makes it more viable, actually. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, well, I hope you have questions, too. If not, I could go on all day. Don't tempt me. I see Mark has questions, too, or notes. Would any of you like to also ask questions of our panel? There's a mic out there. Good, I see hands. We'll start with John and then Donald. Please use a mic right there. Yes. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, this is a question for telecommunications privacy experts, but Sam, you have dealt with many of them as I'm sure uh, the rest of your panel, so I'd welcome all of your thoughts. Is there really any substantive uh, privacy uh, benefit given the state of technology today uh, to requiring that uh, data be stored uh, in a particular geography like Canada or is that purely pandering to populist uh, notions? You know, it occurs to me if you transmit data from British Columbia to Newfoundland through a satellite, you're going way up into the sky and back again. What if the satellite is not a Canadian satellite but owned by China or somebody else? Does that count as be going outside of uh, Canada or no? Uh, and does it make any difference? Uh, from a s privacy and security standpoint? Yeah, I, I think it probably doesn't make any difference. I don't know what the what Canadian officials would say about this instance of transmitting data to it through a satellite. It's actually a very good question, but I think it, it gets to the point that there's a lot of the motivations behind some of what these countries are doing. It sounds very nice, but at the end, it's just window dressing for raw protectionism window dressing to keep U.S. businesses out of their markets in order so that the domestic you know, Russian server farm market or whatever can flourish. So I think the, the digital trade zones, the only way it works is, I mean, there's two ways, right? You could say, we're not going to play your language. This is, this is totally a joke. The European Union lets data, citizen data go to China. Do we seriously believe that your data, yeah, you're a citizen in Germany and your data going to China is more secure than it's coming to the United States. So you could say we reject this notion. We say this, private, this talk of privacy is misleading. We reject it. Or the way the digital trade zones would work is say, all right, we'll, we'll take your word at face value that privacy is important to you and we'll actually play ball with you. We'll actually, within this zone, we'll meet your privacy standards and we have to have access to your markets. So I mean, you could say we don't want to, we don't want to give in to that because it's probably false. But the the digital trade zone only works if you say we want to, we're going to play, we're going to play ball, we're going to speak your language, whether or not we actually believe it's your your honest motivation. Okay. Little hand his hand up, Donald Cochin, Professor Cochin. Thank you all for participating in this panel, as well as all the other panelists today. Um, one thing that we've been talking about are the positive sides of uh, economic advancement or greater protection for privacy, um, opportunities to enhance liberty, to enhance uh, movement of, of, of goods, to enhance um, things that we value on a positive side. Um, one thing that has not been talked about much today in the special jurisdictions uh, uh, context is the dark side. And, and so I would, I would be curious about everyone's comments, including if you could chime in as well, Tom, um, about how do you engage in establishing special jurisdictions of a variety of types without providing uh, facilitation of criminal elements um, and otherwise providing opportunities for uh, shields from criminal liability or criminal investigation in terms of privacy or or uh, ultimate criminal prosecution, access to evidence, um, other things, and or facilitating organized crime or uh, facilitating, uh, you know, 
uh, to the extent that you, you, that there are things that there are black markets which you think should not exist, which I, I assume many people up there actually think there are things that are black markets that should not be black markets. Uh, but to the extent that there are some black markets that should not exist, do they get uh, greater fuel and or opportunities for shields as a result of the establishment of special jurisdictions? Surely they could. And then the question is, how are they established in a way that um, that minimizes the opportunity for exploitation from the criminal element? Great question. The dark side of special jurisdictions. We all get a whack at it. Do you want to go first, Mark? Sure. Um, and, and it relates to some of the issues about culture, uh, the culture that um, issues when people of different uh, commu faith communities, for example, um, uh, interact. Uh, so I think there's a, a, a profound need for a, a live and let live ethos that's non-transgressive um, to be a, a, the baseline for these contractual communities. Um, and it would, I think, distill to something like um, do all you commit to do, do not transgress against the person or property of any other, and give in ways that help others be free. I, I, I would put it in those universalist terms. Um, the technologies are now leading to what David Brin has called sous-valence, um, that we are, every year that's uh, going by, I'm seeing tens of millions of more cameras in public and private spaces. Uh, the traces digitally that all of us leave are, are there and it will increase. And I think that's actually in a way healthy because it incentivizes virtuous behavior. Um, what David Brin also has said is that there should be data vaults, and this gets to the issue of privacy, that uh, the contractual agreements um, in these free, free areas, uh, beyond binding the people contractually to these uh, non-transgressive activities um, and norms, uh, that, that that is something that can be checked on a spot check basis, the data vaults can be opened. And it, much as English law incentivized people, in contrast to the French system, which was micromanaging and opening up all kinds of um, opportunities for corruption, the English law was much, uh, in enforcement was much leaner in the sense of um, having extraordinary penalties invoked when wrongs were done, in contrast to the more lighter penalties the French did. So that had an effect of incentivizing people to virtuous behavior. And I think a, a data fault system that could, under due process, open up anything on the part of the, the govern, governing bodies and their behavior to be subject to this, this spot audit as well as any individual. I think that would that would be a way to deal in civil society uh, to minimize the dark side. Um, all right. I'm not sure I, this pro I shouldn't say anything, but it seems to me the surveillance problem, that's not particular to jurisdictions. I think Donald wants us to point at jurisdiction, special jurisdictions, say there's a special problem the special jurisdiction creates. I don't know. It seems like you're being a little easy on special jurisdictions, Mark, bless your heart. I don't know, go, go ahead, Sam. I mean, I think that, I mean, these digital trade zones, they're possessing a lot of information. So, I mean, in some ways, right, if you're forbearing from certain laws and you're saying, well, it's okay that we're forbearing because we're going to actually have something better than that in the end. Well, if you don't get something better than that, you forbore from maybe some basic backstop protections, and now you've put it in the hands of some private actors and you can just ask them to handle the data appropriately and not sell it to people who are nefarious. So I think that, I mean, that's why you'd want to have some sort of digital trade zone board. You'd want to have some vetting process to make sure that people were actually being honest about it. But, but I think your question gets to a good point about digital trade zones is that how much do you forbear from? You know, like at what point do you forbear from too much and the whole thing goes into the woods? So, I don't know. It's a good question. Someone else should. Are you going to take it away? Write a paper on that. 
Um, the Cayman Islands uh, had a, has had a free banking regime, and in contrast to, to some other offshore banking jurisdictions, it's had a better reputation. And in part, that's because the founders, um, founding banks, agreed to a system where new banks could come in under a sponsorship by one of, one of the founders. Um, but their reputation was on the line if they sponsored a bank that was um, into money laundering or you know, other, other things that they, they, they would feel, feel repercussions um, as the sponsor. Dubai has sponsored immigration. I think that's one reason, John, why, why you know, such an influx of uh, economic migrants has come uh, to Dubai to work in the manufacturing and uh, other uh, various free zones they have there. Um, the sponsor is sometimes abusing that power creates a, a chain of accountability. So I, I would, in, in a world cities, um, ideal world cities uh, concession, um, the concessionaire would be held responsible for the, the good behavior of the various um, sub-developers and the residents within. And faith communities similarly could uh, be incentivized by having a share of the land rents but that share would go up or down based on the, 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 the behavior of the, of the people who were contractually affiliated with them. So those kind of systems, I hope, will create a, a culture of responsibility and liberty. I don't know, Mark. I still hear you talking up zones. I got a long list of things that could go wrong. <laughs> I mean, and in part, you may, I'm congenitally optimist, but uh, like optimist, so I see good things. But as an attorney, I go into looking for problems, and they're all over the place here. I'll just give you a few. I've already named some with these, the way the French and other countries are doing these special international zones. It appalls me as a, as a you know, real liberal, a friend who lo of liberty. It just appalls me that governments are deciding, you know, we're going to roll back the liberties and leave the, we're going to actually augment police powers. I want that to stop, and that's something that special jurisdictions of a sort let them do. Um, I look at the United States foreign trade zone. I think I, I missed, I've read a lot of Moberg's book, which I can recommend. So I, I, I'm pretty sure I know what she said about foreign trade zones. I think I was actually heard you say this. It's not a great example of how to do a zone. It's too small. It ends up just being another tax loophole. It's not really interesting in developing new modes of governance. All the great stuff that Sam talked about, which I agree with, we should have experimentation in governments. Nobody really knows how to solve these hard problems. Some people will fail. We'll learn from the successes. That's not happening with these foreign trade zones, the alternative site designations. That's some accountant telling some guy who owns a factory, well, if you go for the FTZ status, you won't pay customs and duties, but you have to pay for the FTZ status. And they just do the numbers. Totally uninteresting. Just another loophole. My, my fellow friends of the rule of law sometimes come at me saying, I thought everybody was supposed to live under the same rules. They're just suspicious of the whole thing. They say, we, I don't like this. Everyone should be under the same rules. It's a a broader critique of the loophole argument. It's just that they look at the lar even the larger SEZs. And I, I don't agree with this because I'd say to them, oh, so you have Maoist China, and you're going to say we can't have the Sichuan experiment, uh, sorry, the Shenzhen <laughs> experiment because we have to have everyone under Mao's thumb. And I'd say I'm willing to take, uh, I'm willing to swallow that exception to the rule of law in order to get a better system of governance. But it is a critique. I could go on. I'll give you a couple more. And then there's one, the last one's for you, Sam, because I worry about your program on this particular. But before I get to that, one that we should worry about, um, I've talked about in the book, I use Fordlandia. I have a whole chapter on Fordlandia. It was a private city created by the Ford Motor Company in Brazil in the rainforest. It was a total disaster. It ended in rioting and burning and screams of kill the Americans. And that was a private community, front to back. And some of my libertarian friends think, oh, if it's private, all the incentives line up, it'll be fine. Private people do, you know, private institutions that do things so much better than governments. Very often, yes, I'm willing to agree on delivery of mail and all kinds of stuff. Not so sure about cities. I think every working example we've had of a, a, a kind of SEZ we can be proud of has a lot of government oversight. Governments create these. They monitor them. The Honduran example that uh, Land Cow spoke about has a layer upon layer of oversights on these private parties, and I think that's necessary. And without it, you get Fordlandia. And then here's the one to you, Sam. Now, the examples of foreign trade zones are interesting, um, and there, but there, people are trying. Foreigners are, foreigners are trying to get into America. 
So America, to let that happen, all it has to do is say, we're going to ease up on our restrictions and let in this, this, this trade. And the foreign companies are like, the foreign countries are, yay, good. But you know, I love your example with the pirate radio stations, but they were called pirate radio stations because the recipients there were saying, keep out those radio signals. We don't want those. And that's why they had to go to these extreme measures, you know, the offshore ships, foreign flags. So here's something I worry about with your very attractive proposal, Sam, is that Europe will say, we're not interested in letting Americans have this special zone. What do we get out of this? We're not, we either think Americans are going to respect our privacy rights, and the, the domestic information processing uh, industry in Europe says, we don't like the Americans doing this. They're taking our business. So that's a very kind of small little problem, which I, I really like your program, Sam. I want it to flourish, but I do worry about that. You don't have to answer now, but I, I do worry that that basically the countries we need to have cooperation with are going to say, why should we cooperate? America, you're too lax with privacy. You know, we don't want to work with you. Can you answer that, please? Yeah, so it's I kind think of it's, interesting, <laughs> it's interesting you bring that up because I think in the pirate radio example, it wasn't what the pirate radio guys, what the radio pirates, I guess, were doing was already illegal in the jurisdiction. Illegal. Yes. So they were they were coming in and they were doing something that wasn't warranted. Right. In the European Union example, the European Union has actually been very clear about what you need to do. Right? They've laid out a standard that said you should meet this. Presumably, if people in these digital trade zones can meet that standard, it's harder for the Europeans to say, "Oh, well, now you can't come in." because of some other reason. That's true. Whereas the pirate radio guys, they were trying to they were trying to force it, right? They're like trying to bring the rock and roll in and the government says, We don't want this. Okay. So I like did. They put a standard up and says, if you play certain types of rock and roll, you can we'll be okay with this. But if you go beyond that, you play something too weird, we don't want it. So I think that okay. the, that they're actually distinct examples because Europeans have, have put up privacy standards that are cognizable for America. Thank you. That's reassuring. Any other questions? <laughs> I mean, I want it to work. I really do, Sam. But I was a little worried there. I think I think I got new hope. <laughs> uh, for Mark, thanks to, for the handout here. Uh, it's it's very pedagogical, and I I'm, I'm, when I'm reading it, um, I get the sense that when a zone is actually created in the scheme is in the very one of the last, really the last stage here. Before that, it looks like a voucher scheme. And I don't, I don't see the difference. What is the zone concept here? So uh, that's my basic question. So maybe you can elaborate more on the model to clarify that. Thank you. And again, I, I, I would define free zones um, to include the virtual free markets of, of cyberspace, of the cyber economy. There are 40 million freelancers today registered on sites like Fiverr.com, Freelancer.com, and so forth. And um, so anyone who's got access to the internet can jump into this free market and start to build a reputation. The problem is that 80% of the people who register can't land any work at all. Um, they cannot find anyone that will entrust them with that first tiny $5 project that starts them on the path of building a, a reputation. So the first part, the first steps here are preparing talent, and this can include refugees who are, are caught in horrible circumstances, to give them opportunities through these uh, micro stipends, micro vouchers, to engage with ideas about actual free zones and the virtual free markets. The people that do good jobs on these initial tiny projects um, then are able to launch into the, the world of the virtual um, free market and on their own um, get, get paid um, in proportion to, to their success. But this also prepares them with skills that are useful in actual free zones. So that, this is actually, a, there's a, a second uh, infographic that shows both paths where these micro vouchers are used to prepare for the telework markets but also to reward people for doing research into how they can awaken dormant
capital in their own communities, how they can inventory barriers that keep entrepreneurs down and um, propose sites that could become the seed, the, the, the springboard for a quick start free zones, which again, as you pointed out, can be in existing buildings, even a single floor of an existing building. Um, but where you can find through the local action, all of the permits and forms on the web is one way to simplify the startup process. You can find people who have taken action locally to reduce crime. And all of these steps, as long as they're uploading uh, to the blockchain maybe, uh, proof that things are actually changing, they are then levering higher, higher amounts of virtual support. In other words, if you form a, uh, a project to, to wake up the dormant capital, maybe cell phones, using cell phones to record property boundaries and arbitration commitments, everyone who does that unlocks the next level of digital gifts. Um, and how this becomes self-funding, potentially, is a consortium that's giving these digital catalysts to communities would um, make a condition of their higher levels of support with crowdfunding projects and you know, a potential co-investment contingent on their having a share of the land value gain that comes when you actually do free up an area and make it attractive to the risk-taking private developers. Um, Fernando de Soto, who's written a lot about uh, dormant capital, uh, sleeping capital, estimates nine to, tr nine to 14 trillion dollars um, of, of unrealized land value because of dysfunctions in land titling systems, broken court systems, and so on. So the aim here is to get people to appreciate the scale of what can happen once they create a transparent business climate um, in a starter area. That by building trust in that, that actual change, the value of an associated expansion, what we call endowment zone, might be a square kilometer or whatever, that jumps up in proportion to how, how successful they are at making real change in the quick start area. So by flipping the concessions, doing what Hong Kong basically does, you, um, you auctions and tenders for these larger areas, there can be a massive amount of uh, upfront you know, lease payments by, by through the, 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 uh, the tenders, the auctions and tenders, part of which can flow back into a, a system of you know, further extending the reach of these digital gifts on a beach. I, I don't know if that's probably too roundabout, but that's how it hopefully links together. We're, we're almost out of time, but I think we have time, at least for Joe. Joe. All right, so I have uh, two individual questions for both Sam and Mark. Um, I, my question for Mark might clarify his, his remarks a little bit. So essentially the way that I saw the quick start is that it is a single building zone. And normally, as Lotus says, those are very corrupt, very cronyistic. Um, but essentially what a quick start in my, in my reading of, of the work that we've done together is that it, it goes from a single building zone and is able to scale into a full-on city pending metrics that says it's successful. What would those metrics be? Um, the equivalent of a doing business uh, scorecard uh, so that before any of the expansion phases went to market, one would want to invite something like the Fraser Institute or Cato or doing World Bank doing business um, audit of the, of the quality of the business climate. And there's nothing like actual market success to, to verify that it, it's a transparent um, place of clean law. So that there, there's a big upside because if the local initiators of the quick start themselves have shares of what happens with the land values in phase two and, and phase three, they are going to potentially um, have a, a, a quite quite a windfall um, from the auctions and tenders of the expansion areas. So the metrics, I think, are 
ultimately in what is happening with the market value of the land. Very good. Um, and Sam, this goes to you. So in your, uh, your information free zones, um, so we talked a lot of more like information tech, but we live in an era where um, digital assets are, can be things like securities and even currencies. And that obviously has a lot of troubles. Governments would be you know, less willing to swallow the ability to, to freely exchange unregulated securities at will. Would the board of these free information zones, would they restrict these? Or would that be one of the benefits in your view to have the ability to trade currencies and uh, digital cryptocurrencies and securities like ICOs uh, freely? Yeah, it's not something that I thought about it or the paper contemplates about what exactly, the, it's a great question though, about what the board would permit to be traded. I mean, I think certainly we can see the benefits from doing something like that. Uh, but then also realize the cost of that, you know, having uh, unregulated currencies, I mean, obviously the potential to be abused by nefarious people, but uh, but certainly the, the benefits of that would be tremendous. So I, 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 maybe. Yeah. I had assumed it was a secure border, Sam, because with the FTZs, I mean, it, they call it, it's a secure customs area, and they chain link fence and razor wire because they don't want, the stuff comes into the country, some part of the country custom free, they don't want to cross in the fence. I had just assumed it would be like that, but that's interesting. You're suggesting maybe they could let some of the data out under control conditions, maybe? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think that you'd, you would have to have very stringent controls mm -hmm. as you, I mean, certainly you'd, you wouldn't want to have the data leaking unintentionally, but, but maybe there is room there as long as it's still meeting some of the standards of the other jurisdiction. Interesting. Yeah. All right. I think we have time for one more question if uh, somebody wants to ask it. That's okay too. Uh, you, I thought you raised your hand. You're going to clap. So let's call it wrap. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Get me going. Thank you all.